All right, welcome to what is going to be the first of a series of videos about the human ear. And it's really important to make clear right out the bat, this is not an anatomy lesson or a physiology lesson. So it's just going to focus about the biophysical aspect of the ear. And speaking of which, it's a good time to mention that you do need to have idea about the physical properties of sound. And if you don't, it's a good time to go ahead and review those videos. So we're just going to mention the basic anatomy that we need to know to understand the physical background of the ear. And uh, we're going to touch on the role of the ossicles and what is the cochlea and what do we need it for. So let's get started. And first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Virtual Medical Center website that produced this really awesome uh, picture. It's probably one of the best that I've seen, trying to explain what's going on. Right out the bat, I'm going to tell you, don't worry about remembering all the names. What you need to know is to understand the idea. So we have the pinna here. This is the pinna. And we have sound coming through and interacting with the eardrum over here. Let me switch colors. Let me switch colors here. Over here. And this is the boundary between the outer ear, the outer ear, and the middle ear. So now we're entering the middle ear on the other side of the eardrum. And we can see three bones here, not, not, very, uh, not very super clearly. So if, if this is the eardrum, I will have three bones, three bones here, three bones. This is obviously not a very, not a very uh, clear depiction, but it's really important that you understand that we have three bones here. And these bones are called the ossicles, ossicles. And, and from these three bones, we actually move to the inner ear. So this is our middle ear from each side. This is our middle ear, middle ear. And we're moving into the in, inner ear, which is where hearing is interpreted. And it's interpreted in the cochlea. And this is really the cochlea right here. This is, this is the cochlea. And basically, the cochlea has a contact surface with the staple right here. There we go. So the stapes have a contact surface with the cochlea. And if you're wondering, do I really need to know all of how this looks and how this, uh, what's the idea here? No. What you need to know is that the outer ear, the outer ear ends in the, in the uh, eardrum. And the uh, middle ear is basically the, uh, re the region between the, uh, the eardrum and the cochlea. And that the bones, the ossicles, or uh, specifically the stapes, has a contact surface with the cochlea. So you can imagine that if, I, if I'm getting, I'm just going to move here to the left slightly. I'm just going to move to the left slightly. If this is my eardrum right over here, this is my eardrum right over here, I can get a sound wave. And this sound wave would somehow vibrate in the ossicles, and the ossicles would somehow, <coughs> would somehow vibrate, and then they're going to have a contact surface. That means that they're going to vibrate into the cochlea. And this is basically how sound moves from the outside environment to the inside environment. This is basically how, how it goes. <clears throat> and what's important to understand is that inside the cochlea is the organ of corti, the organ of corti. And this is where the hearing is interpreted. But we're going to get to that. Don't really worry about the names of the bones, at least for our, for our little course. <clears throat> Don't worry about uh, knowing this name or knowing uh, the even the organ of Cordy, not super uh, super necessary to uh, remember, but it's really important to understand how hearing mechanisms, how the hearing mechanism takes place. So we're going to try and do that, and let's keep on going and try and interpret the role of the ossicles. And this is somewhat of a better depiction than my own about the ossicles, and this is taken from Wikipedia. And basically, the ossicles have two main roles, two pivotal roles in the, in the, in the hearing process. First of all, of all, mechanical advantage. What do I mean by that? <coughs> advantage. When we say mechanical advantage, we can either, either think of a, of a way over an axis to lift a rock via some sort of branch, if I have a heavy rock, using uh, a fulcrum. Or we can think of, of other ways like, uh, like the pulley, like the pulley, when we're saying to lift some sort of heavy things with 
the pulley, but I find it really easy to explain the mechanical advantage of the ossicles with a baseball bat. So I'm going to use a baseball bat. There we go. So this is me holding a baseball bat. This is me holding a baseball bat. And if I want to move my baseball bat from this position here to this position, to this position here, the baseball bat would actually travel, travel all of this distance, all of this distance. But my arm would only travel a very small distance. My arm would, very, would only travel a very small distance. So while my arm is traveling this distance, the baseball bat is traveling this distance. So this is some sort of advantage. And you can imagine that this is what is taking place in the ossicles. You don't really need to know the exact specifics. But if you understand this idea, then you understand the idea of mechanical advantage with the ossicles. The ossicles are the hand that is holding, uh, in, in essence, that is holding a contact surface with the cochlea here. This is the cochlea. The cochlea is going to be over here. So basically, there's some sort of mechanical advantage going on here. And we know that sound is a vibration. So if I'm vibrating in a sense, and I'm getting a greater vibration on the other end, I'm in some sort amplifying uh, via mechanical advantage. Very good. Did I say, is this two? No, this is one. One. Now, the second idea that we, that we understood from the physical properties of sound is that whenever we have two substances, two materials with two different acoustic impedances, we're going to have reflection and refraction. We're going to have, if there's a sound wave coming here, a small portion of it is going to go in, and some is going to be reflected back. Now, an interesting thing is that whenever sound travels in air and it strikes some sort of fluid, around 99.9% .9 of the energy of the sound wave is lost. And we know that we have air in the outer ear environment. We have air here. And we know now, because I just told you, that the inner side of the cochlea is liquid. It's liquid. The inner side of the cochlea is liquid. So how do I get, how do I get a sound wave that propagates through air into a liquid or aqueous environment without losing 99.9%? What if, what if I could add some sort of material in the middle that is going to be an acoustic bridge. It's going to have some sort of acoustic impedance that can bridge the gap between air and liquid. So if I have air here and I have liquid here, instead of having them interacting with one another and a lot of energy will be lost, they're going to interact via a material. And in this case, it's the uh, bone tissue of the ossicles. So they, can, they are actually an acoustic, br an acoustic bridge, I would say. Acoustic bridge, acoustic bridge, or you can say acoustic impedance bridge, whereas the actual term is impedance matching. Impedance matching. This is a phrase I picked up of the NYC uh, Medical Center, and I was looking for it. Apparently, this is the way to describe this phenomenon, Acu uh, impedance matching or acoustic impedance matching. So this is basically what the ossicles do, and at least for the purpose of our exam, this is what you need to know. Mechanical advantage and some sort of, uh, of acoustic bridge between the air and the liquid or the impedance matching. Perfect. We're going to keep on going, and we're going to talk a little bit about the cochlea, which is the inner ear. Inner ear. And I've already mentioned that it's a liquid environment or it's an aqueous environment. And it's all strung around just like so. And we're going to open it up to, uh, to look into it and see what it's, what it's all about. But one, what we need to understand is the oval window is the contact surface with the stapes, the oval window. So if I'm, I'm to draw the stapes, if you don't even remember what it is, it's just the one last ossicle bone that is in contact with the inner ear. So if, if this is the stapes, let me just label it here. This is the stapes. It has a contact surface, and when the stapes is, is vibrating, when it's vibrating, the oval window is also going to vibrate. So essentially, if I have, and I'm going to stretch, I'm going to move here to the left side so I have some, a little bit more room, and I'm going to, to eventually, I'm going to take the cochlea, I'm going to take this, this round-up thing, this round-up thing, I'm going to stretch it out. I'm going to stretch it out. This is what I'm going to get. This is what I'm going to get. This is the cochlea. And you can imagine that if you, if you took this end and you start winding it around, you're going to end up 
with this. So with a little bit of imagination, we can actually take, take a look at this and we can draw the, uh, the oval window here. And there's another window under it, which I'm going to get to in a second. So I'm drawing the boundary right now between the middle ear and the inner ear. This is the middle ear. And we know that the middle ear is basically the ossicles. And I have, I have the stapes here. Perfect. And when, when the stapes is vibrating, you can think of it's vibrating back and forth with the sound wave. It's just ba vibrating back and forth and back and forth. And that means that the oval, oval window is going to vibrate back and forth. And it's not really important at this second, uh, but there's some sort of, of membrane here. But basically what we need to know is that we have liquid environment. We have a liquid environment inside here. We have a liquid environment inside here. And we already know that liquid is not compressible. Liquid cannot be compressed. So that, so that means that when this oval window comes in, there has to be something else that comes out because I can't press up against the liquid and make it smaller. And it just so happens that this, uh, this mechanical uh, wave can just propagate through and this window is going to be pushed out. So you can think of it, this window is kind of the counterpart. This, uh, the, round, the round window is kind of the counterpart of the oval window. What really is important to know is that when the oval window is going in, the round window is going out, and vice versa. When this, uh, when this tape is, is vibrating backwards and the oval window is vibrating back backwards, uh, the round window is going to vibrate forwards. And this is really what's important to know, the relationship between these two. And the reason why this happens is that the inside is an aqueous solution. And if the inside is an aqueous solution, then it cannot be compressed. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to slice this and look into it. And I know that this, this picture seems kind of daunting. You don't really need to remember what's going on here right away. I'm just going to touch on what's important. But um, off, instead, of, um, instead of just starting explaining, I'm just going to tell you how is this picture achieved? How are we looking? Uh, what are we looking at? So if this is the cochlea that I stretched out, just like before, if this is the cochlea that I stretched out, if I'm standing right here, I'm this little person standing right here, and I'm looking into the cochlea, this is, the, this is what I would see. So this circle here, you can imagine, is this circle, and you're staring right into it. You're staring right into it. So first of all, what's important to see, what's important to see is that we have an aqueous solution, and in, inside of it, we have some sort of membrane. You can see that we have some sort of membrane. And again, I'm looking inside, so this membrane is really going almost the entire length almost the entire length of the cochlea. And this is the membrane. This is the, the tectorial membrane. And what's, what's good to know about the tectorial membrane is that with the vibrations of the oval main window, the tectorial me membrane would also vibrate. And under it, we have the organ of corti. And the organ of corti is basically responsible for interpreting sound. It's basically responsible for the interpreting sound. And what's also important to know is that the organ of corti is comprised from two types of hair cells. And when I say hair cells, they're called hair cells because they have little hairs here. Hair cells are responsible for the uh, interpretation of sound or rather, in, in specific, turning the vibration, the vibration into action potential. Turning the vibration in some way into action potential. So if I have a cell that can, that can take vibration and can make action potential out of it, I can interpret sound. And this is what's going on here. So I'm going to stop right now. And in the next video, I'm going to venture forth and look into one of these hair cells and how do they work. But before I do, another pretty important thing to understand, and I know this is, this is a very superficial explanation of the human ear, so I'm really just focusing on things that I imagine they may ask. And I know that there has been a question before, and this appears on the lecture slides. If this is the cochlea, and this is the oval window, and this is the round window, and I have my pictorial membrane here, and what's good to understand is that high frequency sound is interpreted here, is interpreted here, closer to the oval window, cl closer to the stapes, and lower frequency sound is interpreted here, is interpreted here, or closer to the side, or with some affinity. So when we're saying high frequency, it's closer to the middle ear, or the oval window, or the stapes, any of these step would be correct. And when we're talking about uh, uh, lower frequency, 
uh, sound waves, it's interpreted further away from these elements or further away into the cochlea. So it's good to know, I'm not going to really get into the anatomical implications, but this is just something that's good to know. So I'll see you in the next video.